Good morning. So one of my greatest fears as a speaker occurred as I was sitting back there waiting to come up. I, I got a case of the hiccups. What are you going to do if you're 30 seconds to broadcast and you got the hiccups? I guess I just stand up here and hold my breath, right? Anyway, thank the Lord that's over. I'm grateful to be here this morning. I want to tell you, I don't know, I can't shake a certain feeling that the Holy Spirit put in my heart last night. It's like it won't go away. And I couldn't believe the message that was scheduled for today in light of what happened last night. And I don't know if all of you are aware, if you keep up with the news, but wow. Last night, uh, I happened to be in Taya's living room. Y'all know my friend Taya that baptized with me, and she's 15 years old. And I was in the living room with her, and there was a big screen TV, and I had Fox News on as I was following what happened. And if you don't know, for the first time in all of history, the soil of Iran, from their own soil, from their own territory, they launched missiles and drones against Israel. That's never happened before. Proxies in different places have done it, but never from Iranian soil has that happened. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm so emotional other than, you know, I've been preaching the gospel since I was 16, but about a dozen years ago, the Holy Spirit dropped into my heart and made it very clear to me that I was supposed to emphasize prophecy as a part of my ministry. And that wasn't always the case. And it just gets to me. My sadness over Christians who don't understand who are, are not paying attention, not taking it seriously, just going on with life. But as I was in the living room last night with Taya, and I had Fox News on the big screen TV, an actual photo in real time of the, the picture that was up there when I was able to pause the TV, and she asked me a question. And in bright yellow, I just can't get out of my mind, in bright yellow, Fox News had outlined, you know, Iran, that whole country. And then, of course, over here, a tiny little size of New Jersey, Israel, right? And they had huge red arrows just, you know, glowing off the yellow map. Huge red arrows of how the drone and missiles had been taken over and put at Israel. Now, it opened up a can of worms because, of course, when something like that happens, I'm like standing at the television and I'm like, you know, taking this all in and, you know, I'm asking the Lord and I'm and so Taya asked me, you know, a very simple question, which led into a whole entire thing. So there's me in front of the large screen TV, and I'm like, and of course, you know, Russia's up here. It would be up there near the ceiling, and over here, you know, and I'm trying to, ex and we're talking about everything, you know, why this is happening. And But let me just say this. When I picture those red arrows coming from that country into Israel, and as, as Taya asked me the question, why is everybody always picking on Israel? Which got into the whole satanic battle behind it. As I'm sitting in the back getting ready to come up and speak, the Lord kind of dropped in my heart and the image of those arrows. What I want you to understand is Satan is trying to attack God's land and God's people. However, we understand that Israel politically and geographically as it is today, the people of Israel are not turned to Jesus Christ. And so some people say, why are you always praying for Israel? They don't even believe in the Messiah. I'm going to tell you why. God promised that land to his people 4,000 years ago. And here's what the Holy Spirit whispered to my heart back there. Satan is attacking the promise that Jesus is going to come and reign from Jerusalem. Satan is attacking the promise that God's people will en masse turn back to the Messiah during the tribulation. Satan is attacking the promise, the prophecy of what he knows is coming to be. Whether you have much respect for Israel as it is today or not. 
And here was the bigger point that the Holy Spirit put my heart back there. I ain't all that I'm cut out to be. Satan is only attacking the promise of the Shelley Prindle that will one day be. Do you hear what I'm saying? Satan attacks the promise. We're not where God is taking this world yet. And you are not where God is taking you yet. But there is a devilish, satanic, critically serious, solemn attack that is happening in geography and politics. You better be understanding it's happening in the spiritual realm. This is huge. What happened yesterday is huge. It's gigantic. As they keep saying on the news, unprecedented. It has never happened before. Right. And as I was able to explain to Taya, and I thank God that she's listened to my messages since she was yo big. Because as I explained some things she didn't understand, I kept asking, and you know what happens after that, right? And she knew. She knows. Antichrist, the peace treaty, the whole thing. But if your spiritual ears are not listening and you do not understand that the massive chaos, and I heard before I went to bed last night, a reporter say these words, because of what has happened, there will never be a Middle East like there was yesterday anymore. This is going to break out into a whole regional thing. The good news, the world is soon going to welcome him. Oh, it's chaos over there. Middle East is not ever going to be what it was before. No, it's not. It's going to get so bad, so crazy, so hot over there that the man of sin, the Antichrist, will soon charismatically and with great comfort to the unbelievers stand somewhere and be broadcast by satellite that he has come up with a peace treaty. And the world will run to that peace treaty. It's fake. It only lasts three and a half years. You with me? Everything that's happening. And not to mention that Iran, Iran, however you pronounce it, and Russia and Turkey are three of the biggest players in the battle of Gog and Magog as outlined in Ezekiel. Nobody can be doctrinally sure of when that battle happens. I personally, my opinion is that it happens after the rapture of the church, but the rapture of the church could happen any second. And isn't it ironic that you have Russia and now Iran on its own territory standing up and fighting who they want to fight. Russia trying to take Ukraine, which encringes on the Western Confederacy that I believe is about to erupt, and Iran against Israel. It's crazy. If you can't watch the news, if you're a Christian who cannot watch the news and understand just a little bit of the framework of what's happening, you need to get in your Bible more. If you haven't watched the whole Revelation series, there's other good ministries to go to. I know for a fact because it's what I have spoken. I stand by what I have preached through the entire book of Revelation. You can go to that. But you need to understand and you need to wake up because what's happening in my heart is this pressing, pressing, pressing urgency and an utter disgust with Christians who are just living life as if nothing has changed just going about their business and not even thinking about what's happening in the world. Because it should be pressing on you so hard. And I'll tell you something else. If you're going to post to Facebook, pray for Israel, which we should. How many of you know the Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for Israel? I'm not coming against that, but I'm taking it further. If you're going to post, pray for the peace of Israel, number one, you better be praying. But number two, it's not just about praying for Israel. It is about praying that every 
person who is involved in this, all the people who live in the Middle East, all the people who are in countries that are watching it happen, it is about praying for the salvation of souls because the end is here. So don't be telling me you're just praying for Israel, but you're not down on your knees praying for the Iranians, praying for the wicked rulers across the world today to somehow turn to Christ, if it could possibly be. Because I want to stand here and tell you something else I was convicted about this morning. When you read your Bible, okay, now don't get me wrong. Okay, many, many people have already gone to hell, right? And many people who are alive today and in the future will be in hell. But I want to make something very clear that I find so interesting in the Word of God. In the Word of God, other than Satan, there are only two human beings that the Bible prophesies. It's a foregone conclusion. In other words, what God prophesies, does it always come true? Okay, so there are two human beings, only two in all of Scripture, that God has stood on his ground and said, these two people are going to be in the lake of fire. There's only two. And who are they? Does anybody know? The Antichrist and his false prophet. Those are the only two. Now, I find that interesting. Because you can say whatever you want to say about leadership in the world today and say, well, he's damned to hell and they're lost and gone. Okay, maybe so. But maybe not. Because the Bible doesn't tell me only two people are predestined as far as God showing us for hell. Anybody else is fair game to get saved before Jesus comes back. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. So it's about time for us to rise up and witness to the people in our own lives, even the people we think the most damnable, the people we think the most lost. And don't just post to Facebook, I'm praying for Israel. Pray for Israel. Because Israel's lost. Pray for Russia. Pray for Iran. Pray for peoples all across the world. Pray for Vladimir Putin. Pray for wicked rulers to be brought to their knees to turn to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we got to be doing. Okay, that's my little pre-sermon before the sermon. Is that okay? I feel it in my heart. I feel it. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to tell you what. I feel it deep down inside. All right, Daniel chapter 2, here's where we are. This is our message today, and it kind of dovetails with this to some degree because we're going to talk about the shadows of the Antichrist coming, which, my goodness, what a morning to talk about such things, right? So Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 41, and I'll review with you with a graphic in a minute what's been going on, but you all know, Daniel is interpreting the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Remember the statue? The head of gold? Okay. So here we are at the feet portion of that image. Daniel 2.41. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. 
The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we bow our hearts before you on this solemn morning, truly. And my heart breaks for so many supposed Christians and churches who turn a blind eye to what your word has outlined for us and who go on living each day as if nothing is really ever going to change. But something is about to happen. And that is what Jesus, you have said throughout your word, that we must always be ready. Jesus, when you were on earth, you said we have to work while it is daylight because night is almost here. And I pray that you would reach every heart that is hearing those who need Jesus, that they would call upon him. And those Christians who are complacent, just going about life like the people in Noah's day did, not paying attention, not spreading the gospel, that you would wake us up. Let those who want to understand your word concerning prophecy, let them be able to understand as they yield their hearts to you. And I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You remember what we're talking about here in Daniel chapter 2. We're talking about the image, the dream that God gave evil King Nebuchadnezzar and had Daniel interpret. And you remember that we talked about the kingdoms. And this is so interesting because all four of the kingdoms from the top down to the very bottom, right? Four of them, how many of you know in real time and in real history... Four of them have already come and gone. Amen? So what's preventing you from believing that the last will not? This is what, this is what, ugh, ugh. I know Christians aren't supposed to strangle people. Ugh, I get so upset. Why do we say we believe the word of God if we do not believe in what's to come? We know that after the end times revived Roman Empire that we're going to get into today, we know the ultimate solution is the kingdom of Jesus Christ comes in as a stone cut by no human hand, right? Comes and obliterates and blows to pieces all the other kingdoms and then stands as a mountain forever. Who's excited about that? All right? We're almost there. We're almost there. So let's talk about this. And isn't God good in his providence that this would be the message? We, we didn't know what was going to be happening. This is incredible to me. As you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. Now, how many of you think what God's trying to get across from us is this is going to be partly and partly, right? It's going to be some of this and some of that. It's going to be try to hold together, but it's not going to hold together, right? I mean, that's the basic gist of it. What we're talking about here is the feet and toes of the statue, remember? Because Babylon was the head, Medo-Persia was the arms and the chest, Greece, the thighs, the middle. Rome is the long, long legs, and we talked about why. How many of you remember why Rome is the elongated iron legs? Because in a sense, Rome is what? Rome is still here, okay? That's why it's the elongated part. And coming soon to a world near you are the toes. This, these feet, these toes represent the end times revived Roman Empire. See that word there? Why do I call it, many Bible scholars call it the revived Roman Empire? Because there is a sense in which the spirit of Rome is still with us today. And that's what we're going to address in modern times. 
And I'm going to refer to J. Vernon McGee, whom I greatly, greatly respect. And I want you to remember as I'm reading this, he's not, we're not reading it as if he's writing it in 2024. He lived from 1904 to 1988, but even in that time frame, listen to what he said, and then I'm going to show you some modern things. No great world power follows Rome. The Roman Empire is the last, and it will be in existence in the latter days. Actually, said J. Vernon McGee in the 1900s, it exists today. All of these other empires were destroyed by an enemy from the outside, but no enemy destroyed Rome. The Roman Empire fell apart from within. No enemy destroyed it. I was at the public library the other day getting out a bunch of old books. You guys know I love to smell old books. I mean, really old books about Rome. And I was like, yeah, you know, this is true. You read any history of Rome, they fell from within. Rome is living in the great nations of Europe today. Italy, France, Great Britain, Germany, and Spain are all part of the old Roman Empire. How many of you knew that? The laws of Rome live on and her language also. No one speaks Latin today, which was the language of Rome. But it is basic to understanding French, Spanish, and other languages. Now, I can testify to this because little nerd Shelley Terman, she was then, going to school. I loved school. Oh, I loved school. Oh, I played school when I wasn't at school. I mean, I was all about it. I ended up taking four years of Latin in high school. Four years of Latin. Nobody even speaks Latin. And I stand here to testify that although I had a good teacher, I thought, I only remember one word. <laughs> one word. I can't even speak a sentence. All I know is that, and it's, it's a word you're all familiar with, farmer. Agricola. That's all I remember. However, having four years of Latin really gave me an advantage to studying the Bible, to being a writer, and to being a reader, because so much of English and many other languages is rooted in Latin. Most words have a Latin root, and, and my mind is able to pick up on that. Okay, so this is true, that Latin still stands as the underpinning language of many other languages, and Rome's warlike spirit lives on also. Europe has been at war ever since the empire broke up into these kingdoms. Okay, J. Vernon McGee, were you like watching TV with me last night? Or, I mean, this is incredible. We're driving up here and I was saying, listen, Russia is encringing on Ukraine. That's all Europe. Do you understand? This is crazy what's going on. And so, so true. What's happening in Europe today? Now remember, McGee's writing in the 1900s. He said, there is a new psychological viewpoint developing. Wow, was he prophetic in this. If you study what cultures are doing over there in France and other countries, it's as wild or maybe more wild over there than it is here in America. There's a new psychological viewpoint developing. The young people there do not want to be called Italians or Germans. They want to be called what? Europeans. Such thinking is creating a basis for the man who is coming someday to put the Roman Empire back together again. He is known in Scripture as the man of sin or the Antichrist. Europe, Europa, right? Even more so today than even then, people of Europe want to be known for their collective existence, hence we even have today the European Union and a European currency. Are you hearing me on this? This is a, a map of Europe today. Now Europe has 44 countries that are a part of it, 50 if you count the six countries that are transcontinental. Countries that exist both on the continent of Europe and the continent of Asia. For example, Russia exists in both places. Now, taking this from 
Britannica.com just the other day, right? So this is up-to-date info. Here's what they said. The empire, and, and I hate that they used CE, by the way. How many of you know that many people have gone from BC, AD to BCE and CE? Have you ever noticed that? Don't buy into it and don't use it. I'm only doing it here because it's a quotation, so I have to quote it. But if it were me, I would be putting AD and BC. BC means before Christ. People don't want that religious stuff, so they now call it BCE, before the common era. AD, Latin, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. That's what AD means. But now it's CE, common era. Don't use that. Rebel against it. Anyway, quoting them. The empire of ancient Rome at its greatest extent in the second century CE revealed and imprinted its culture on much of the face of the continent. This is from Botanica. Do you see what they're saying? They're saying ancient Rome imprinted its culture on the whole continent. They go on to say, trade relations beyond its frontiers also drew the remoter regions into its sphere. So it even went further and drew more regions in. Yet it was not until the 19th and 20th centuries that modern science was able to draw with some precision the geologic and geographic lineaments of the European continent. This is the part I want you to focus on the peoples of which had meanwhile achieved domination over and set in motion vast countervailing movements among the inhabitants of much of the rest of the globe. So we see, this isn't a biblical site, we see the affirmation that the Roman Empire of past through modern Europe has spread influence where? Over the globe. Everybody still with me? I hope this isn't sounding too much like school, is it? It is. Uh, poor Levi. He's like, sorry, Levi. You're still my friend, right? It's still more exciting than it is in school because we're applying, well, you go to Christian school, but we're applying it to what really matters here. So it's worth learning. Okay, so look, J. Vernon McGee again. In the 1900s, he said, they have a common market in Europe today, and they may well be along in restoring the Roman Empire. But not until God takes down the roadblock will the man appear and all this come to fruition. Because he is Satan's man, God will not let him appear until God has called out his people to his name. When he has done that, he will remove his church from the earth. Now, J. Vernon McGee refers to this common market, which in his day it was still called the common market, I guess, at the time of his writing. But I just want to give you a little current events history lesson here. In 1958, it was the European Economic Community is how this thing, the umbrella under which this commonality of the European nations came together, or the EEC. But, and, and that was otherwise known as a common market. That's what McGee is referring to there. But in 1967, it was renamed and came under the umbrella of the European Community, or the EC. You'll see that reference a lot. In 1993, it became the European Union. And if you want to check out the European Union, go to their website. It's very interesting to do so. Look at their vision statement and what they're about and how they feel about Israel and how they feel about Ukraine. Just check it all out. It's very good to know. This is the European Union. These are the countries today of the European Union. There are 27 27 of the European countries have agreed, 27 out of the 44 or 50, depending on which way you look at it, have decided to come together and unify themselves. So I want you to look at the map for just a second. 
geographically, not that you have to memorize each country, but I want you to look at the area that is covered there of the European commonality, if you will. Because, look at this. This is the Roman Empire in 117 AD. Okay. Do you see, if you're looking at the where the water is, and the sh look at Italy, keep Italy, it's easy, the boot to remember. Look at this. See where the boot is there? Okay, so do you see the Roman Empire of old compared to today's? Now, this is not going to be the extent of the European Union, it may not be, because there are countries that are trying to get into the European Union even now, including Ukraine, right? But right now, this is where it stands, and you can see the old Roman Empire. This was the division of the Roman Empire. This is where it stood around 400 AD. And again, look at Italy. Look at the boot there. Okay, and you can see that the Roman Empire was more extensive than the European Union, right? It was even more extensive, but it was centered around that area. Here is a modern-day overlay, okay, with the modern-day borders of old Roman Empire. Just look at that. Does everybody know where Iran is there? I mean, you can see Israel to the right of the Mediterranean. Go off to the right. Do you see the red going down there into the Persian Gulf, way off to the right of the screen? That's ancient Mesopotamia, Babylon, the place from which Abraham was called out to go to the land of Canaan, which is Israel today. And then finally, here's a map of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. And I just want you to look at this map. I want you to, uh, oh, do I have the laser pointer in here? Oh, I do. Look at this. Oh, it's not a real lesson until you get to use the laser. I know I've done this before, and I used to do this to my students, put the dot on different people, because you can't get it off once it's on, right? See, look. See, Henry? Look at Henry's arm. What's he going to There's nothing he can do. If he tries to wipe it off, it's on his hand. Anyway, look at this. Here's what's happening. Here's Iran. They just sent missiles over here to tiny little Israel. See that? But all of this encompasses what used to be the old Roman Empire. Isn't that something else to think about? Trying to get some things in your brain this morning that you might not have been thinking about while you were eating your Cheerios this morning. But it's important. Now, this is from the European Union's own website, and here's what, here's what they say. They themselves say, the European Union is committed to effective multilateralism with the United Nations, that's a whole other story, at its core. This is a central element of the EU's external policy. We want to respond successfully to global crises, threats, and challenges. The international community needs an efficient multilateral system founded on, say it with me, universal rules and values. Whenever you hear that, your heart should sink. Universal applies to everybody everywhere. International court of law, universal rules and codes of conduct. One world anything is going toward Antichrist. Just pointing this out for you guys. When they talk about multilateralism, what are the principles of multilateralism? I want to call your attention to one thing from Botanica. Those principles are an indivisibility of interests among the participants. In other words, everybody has to be indivisible in what we all want and agree to. A commitment to diffuse reciprocity and a system, watch this, a system of dispute settlement intended to enforce a particular mode of behavior. Isn't that something? Multilateralism. Okay. But we're going to see that even though the EU wants to be all united, there's some struggles going on. So let's talk about this. And hence comes what God said in the first place. As you saw the feet and toes, which are going to be the end stage, they're going to be partly of clay and partly of iron. How many of you know clay and iron aren't going to work well together? <laughs> Not going to hold, right? All right. 
It shall be a divided kingdom. This end times Roman Empire will be divided. It will be partly strong and partly brittle. Okay? That's obvious. God is trying to tell us it's not going to hold together well. Warren Wearsby, it will be difficult for things to hold together at the end of the age. <laughs> okay, I think we're living it right now. I think that <laughs> things aren't holding well together anywhere. And this is what I'm telling you. That's why the Bible says Satan will have a man stand up at the end and say, I can hold everything together. And God will allow Satan to enable him in that deception for three and a half years. Until he turns the tables and says, ha, just kidding. Everybody worship me. But do you see how it sets up the stage for him to be able to do that? Okay, now watch this. It will be difficult for things to hold together at the end of the age. The feet of the image were composed of a mixture of iron and clay. Iron is strong and durable, but clay is weak and prone to crumble. The iron in the image gives the appearance of strength and endurance, but the clay announces just the opposite. I just thought of this, never thought of it before. It's like each one of us is individual people. We try to be strong and resolute, don't we? But sometimes your weakness creeps in, right? You can think of that in terms of the world power at the end. In fact, the clay robs the iron of its ability to hold things together. For wherever the iron touches the clay, at those points there is weakness. Society today is held together by treaties that can be broken, promises that can be ignored, traditions that can be forgotten, organizations that can be disbanded, and money-making enterprises that can fail. All of it is iron mixed with clay. Hallelujah. There is nothing strong but Jesus Christ and the person who's holding on to him. That's it. We see this more and more. John Phillips, in the final phase of the empire, the iron was mixed with miry clay. The clay clearly symbolizes the democratic element that was prominent in the Roman Empire. In spite of the admixture of clay, the strength of the iron remained right down to the feet. There might have been a democratic element to the Roman Empire, but how many of you know the Roman Empire ruled with an iron fist? Wherever the iron could be maintained, strength would be in evidence. Wherever the whims and wishes of the people could prevail, weakness would result. And any despot, any person who tries to rule with an iron fist in any country, even today, we see it all the time, there will be those who just fall in line and do whatever they're told to do, and there will be those who what? No way, I'm rebelling, I'm not doing this, right? It's never going to work. There's only one person under which nobody can rebel. Tell me his name. Jesus. Okay? Efforts to weld the two, dictatorship and democracy, would fail. Just as all efforts to weld iron and clay must fail, those who maintain the principles symbolized by the iron will try in vain to amalgamate themselves with those who uphold the principle symbolized by the clay. Daniel 2.43 As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Now this phrase here, mix with one another in marriage, in the English Standard Version, I'm going to show you it in some other versions, is a very difficult phrase. It's much differently interpreted. It's even differently translated. But let's try to get to a basic gist of what it may mean. If we look at mix with one another in marriage in this end times uh, Roman Empire, the New American Standard Bible says they will combine with one another in their descendants. Okay? They'll be intermarrying or their descendants will come from them. In the NIV version, the people will be a mixture. Is how it's rendered there. In the New Living Translation, these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage. Okay? There's all kinds of different translations of this as you try to dig back. And even the best of Bible scholars, a little bit, we can guess at what this probably means. 
I love John Walvert. I think he's square on point. He said, this reference to marriage has given rise to several interpretations from actual intermarriage among peoples in this last kingdom to the mixing of diverse peoples in the empire. Some also feel this is a reference to the attempted political marriage between imperialism and democracy, which I think in our world today, that very well could be a great interpretation of this because it's what we see all over the world. We've got Russia, we know what kind of power they are, coming after Ukraine, and Ukraine is wanting to come into the European Union. We've got, we've got all kinds of, you know, despot power going on and also places that want to have a say for themselves, a democracy. Keel writes, as in the three preceding kingdoms, gold, silver, and bronze represent the material of these kingdoms. In other words, the materials represent the peoples and their culture, right? And all the other ones. So also in the fourth kingdom, iron and clay represent the material of the kingdoms arising out of the division of this kingdom. In other words, the national elements out of which they are constituted and which will and must mingle together in them. It'll be a very mingled kind of empire, different viewpoints, different people groups coming together, trying to hold together. While intermarriage may form an element of it, it's not necessarily the main idea. The important point is that the final form of the Roman Empire will include diverse elements. Whether this refers to race, political orientation or regional interests. And this will prevent final form of the kingdom from having a real unity. Just look at America today. Okay, There is such a thing as healthy and right diversity. And then there is such a thing as lunacy. We are living in a society that is absolutely lunatic, trying to meld together things that should never be put together. Are you with me? So I think this could have an element of literal intermarriage. Obviously, people living in close proximity might intermarry, but I think it's a bigger kind of intermarriage. And there's something I never saw before till I sat down this morning before I came to church and I was reading over the text, laid my hand on the text and prayed over what I was going to say. And something popped out of me that never popped out at me before until an hour before I got here. And that is verse 43 when it says, as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together. You know what I thought to myself? Thank God. The marriage of the bride of Christ to Christ will hold together. Hallelujah. That's what popped out to me. I think there'll be a devotion coming up on it. Never heard anybody say that before. But I was like, all this talk about this marriage and how it's interpreted. Interestingly, whatever the world tries to marry together, it ain't going to work. You got to marry yourself to one. And that is Jesus Christ. We got to be his bride. All right. This, of course, born out of the fact that the world empire at the end of the age breaks up. How many of you know this? This is... Daniel, later on, we'll get to this in detail, but this final form, this Antichrist kingdom, this revived Roman Empire that's soon to come on the face of the earth, it breaks up into a gigantic civil war. Who, who would doubt that? I mean, you think Antichrist is going to have success? No. It's going to be a civil war. Because everybody... People who are not truly yielded to Jesus Christ can never have real unity. They can buy into somebody's program and promises for a while, but when it comes down to it, if you don't have Jesus Christ, the only person you're living for is yourself. And when it comes down to it, if somebody crosses you in a certain way, you're going to rebel. And that's how the Antichrist or this revived Roman Empire, this is how it ends up. And it's outlined for us in Daniel chapter 11. I'm just going to show you a few verses from there. Look at this. It breaks up into a gigantic civil war in which forces from the south, east, and north 
contend with the ruler of the Mediterranean for supremacy. Now, John Walvoord believes, many others, and I believe, that this ruler that is being referred to here in Daniel chapter 11 is the Antichrist. And even his own, at one point, turn against him. That's how you end up with the Battle of Armageddon. Why do you think all these people gather together? They don't, they don't necessarily know what they're gathering together for, but they're all drawn to Jerusalem for the Battle of Armageddon. I think it has to do a lot with they're sick of the Antichrist, they're coming against him, they don't realize they're really going to come against Jesus. Like, it's crazy in the end. It's chaos. How many of you know sin only leads to chaos? Order comes from God. Order and peace comes from God. Chaos comes from Satan. Chaos comes to a person. It comes to a life. It comes to a family. It comes to a nation. Chaos comes to all who yield to Satan. And it's going to come. Even though this will seem to last for a little while. In Daniel 11, just a few verses to show you what I mean. At the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him. Who's him? The Antichrist. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. But the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind. With chariots and horsemen and with many ships. Verse 44. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. So he is attacked and then what does that make him do? Attack even more. Back to our main text. And here's the good part. In the days of those kings. What days are we talking about? The days of what kings? The days of Antichrist and all of his minions, right? In the days of the coming Western confederacy that Antichrist will emerge from. In the days of the revived Roman Empire, the shadows of which we are definitely seeing right now. Who's excited to be living in those days? In the days of those kings... And the reason I'm, I'm going to get I'm going to get excited here, I'm going to show you why. My opinion, and many others' opinion, it only makes sense to believe in a pre-millennial return of Jesus Christ. It makes no biblical sense to believe that we, the church, in any way, shape, or form, bring in a millennial kingdom. We cannot do it. We have not done it, and we will not do it. It takes a literal return of our Savior to literally rule on earth. And if this prophecy doesn't show you that, I don't know what else will. Watch this. In the days of those kings, meaning, while that is all still literally in existence on the earth, you with me? Has, has Babylon, was Babylon just figurative or literal? Was Medio Persia literal? Yes. Was Greece and Alexander the Great, was that literal? Yes. Was the Roman Empire real and literal? Yes. Will Jesus Christ's return be literal? Will his kingdom be a kingdom where he honestly comes down to the face of the earth and rules from Jerusalem? Yes. The millennium is something that happens after. My Savior comes to set up shop. And I want to add one more thing because this is the end of my message and I know I'm getting wound up. I'm starting to sweat. When I was watching the videos last night, right before bed, I was watching the videos of those missiles and drones as they were hitting the Iron Dome, as the United States and Jordan assisted Israel in preventing those missiles from doing the damage for which they were intended. I don't know how anybody see that footage. If you haven't, go find it. Get on the internet. Find somebody who has it to show you. Here's what. 
So I'm sitting there and I'm watching, and it was Fox News coverage that I was watching, and there were these nighttime videos, okay, of the lights in the sky coming, the missiles coming, them being intercepted, and it looks like fireworks in the night, okay? But you know what it is. And so there were two particular videos against the night sky with these lights, you know, these missiles and interceptors sailing through the sky against the darkness of the night. And Fox News showed two particular videos. One was a recording from Jerusalem. And one was a recording from Bethlehem. You say, Shelly, why are you so worked up about that? Because I'm sitting there and I'm watching these videos, night sky, and I'm watching these lights sail through the dark sky, knowing this is war on Israel. First of all, Bethlehem. I'm watching footage from Bethlehem. It's massive balls of light through the sky, which is an attack on God's people. And you know what my mind went to? 2,000 years ago. That bright, bright star in the sky that told anyone who was seeking Jesus, this is where he's at. And then I saw the footage from Jerusalem, an attack against God's place, right? And I thought to myself, oh boy. One day, you're going to see something that can break even the Iron Dome. You're going to see Jesus himself descend from the skies over Jerusalem. Going to put his literal feet down on the Mount of Olives and bust the thing in half. In the days of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. See that? That's where the statue ends, my friends. There ain't no other people but the people of God. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Now before we go any further, just... Listen to the narrative there. And how many of you take from this that what God means to say is, here's the statue. It was all very real. It is very real right now. Here's my Savior coming in to bust it up. And his kingdom is also going to be what? Literal and real on the face of the same earth. Remember the statue. We're looking at the end times revived Roman Empire. We're looking particularly at the feet and the toes, which we'll get into more detail in Daniel as we go along. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. You know what I did last night? I took the New Testament Bible that I was given when I graduated from high school that my pastor gave to me. The same pastor that told me I had the anointing of God to preach when I was just a girl. I took that Bible and I held it in my hands to fall asleep last night. And as I was holding the Bible, I prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know every time, that I, I've been to churches that do this, and there's times that we can pray the Lord's Prayer. It's, a, it's not a sin to pray the Lord's Prayer, but I hate when people start using it as a rote prayer. And every time you go to church, you repeat the Lord's Prayer. Because everybody's standing there, you know nobody's thinking a word about what they're saying. The next time you pray the Lord's Prayer, you read this sentence. I want you to think of Daniel. I want you to picture that image and Jesus Christ the stone rolling in to break all the other kingdoms to pieces, right? While you're watching what's going on in the Middle East, I want you to pray this prayer. When you pray this prayer, 
And this is the other way the church has gone tilt. Oh, so many preachers, so many people led astray. There are pastors and preachers now on social media, major people that uh, people are listening to who, it's this whole thing of they, the kingdom now theology. You know, like, uh, Lord, your kingdom come. It's being done right now. Your kingdom is here. Your will is being done on earth. Listen, in your own heart, you can bring the kingdom of God to the world. You can do the will of God in your life. Not perfectly, but you can do it. But this day will only come when Jesus returns in its fullest sense. Amen? Don't anybody fool you on that. And that's why we got to hold strong about understanding what the millennium is, what the return of Jesus Christ is. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you remember what Jesus also said? He said to the Roman authorities, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Where does God's kingdom come from? Heaven. Jesus is going to roll in from heaven. Antichrist is a man of the earth. Christ is a man of heaven. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. John Phillips. Christ's kingdom will come not by evolution, not by a gradual leavening of mankind by the gospel. Okay, that's, that's false teaching when people say, we can do so much good. We can bring so much of the gospel. We can help people so much. We can usher in the kingdom of God. It will come by divine intervention. Just like your salvation had to come from heaven, so your final deliverance must come from heaven. And if anybody looking at this world and looking inside your own heart thinks otherwise, you are nuts. Yes, I said it. You're nuts. It will be imposed sovereignly on the world by God. And it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Now listen, when he says he'll set up a kingdom, it just flows from the other kingdoms. Like now all these were kingdoms and now God's going to set up a kingdom. This dream and interpretation, both given by God Almighty to Nebuchadnezzar through the prophet Daniel, necessitate a premillennial position. What does premillennial mean? It means the second coming will occur prior to the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. That's what it means. Jesus physically returns to the Mount of Olives and fights the battle of Armageddon before he sets up a millennial kingdom. We don't bring in the kingdom. <laughs> we haven't even done a good job bringing in the little bit of the kingdom we should have been, let alone bring in the final status of a perfect earth. John Walvoord. The effect is that the fifth kingdom, right? The stone that rolls in. The fifth kingdom... The kingdom of God replaces completely all vestiges of the preceding kingdoms. A prophecy that can only be fulfilled in any literal sense by a reign of Christ over the earth. How many of you see that more clearly now? Maybe you didn't know before in the Bible that God spells out all the world kingdoms from past to present to future. Maybe you didn't know he spelled it out so clearly and in such a straight line, but doesn't he? We have no reason to believe that Jesus isn't coming back to be the literal ruler from Jerusalem, which I posted to Facebook this morning. I said, and, and I was doing it in light of all the attacks on Israel, but of course I want to say, make no mistake about it. Jesus is coming back to reign from Jerusalem. 
the premillennial position which correlates this event with the second coming of Christ allows literal fulfillment of the symbolism involved in the destruction of the image. All the other kingdoms were destroyed. And when Jesus truly comes back to this earth in person, he will truly destroy the Antichrist kingdom. And he will truly set up his kingdom on earth for 1,000 years. And part of the purpose of that is to keep every promise that was made to Israel. Because many will turn back to Christ. Many Jews will turn back to Christ during the tribulation. There's not one promise that God made to Israel that he is not going to keep. Do you believe that? There's not one promise God's made to the church that he's not going to keep. But the church and Israel are two different entities and God keeps his promises to both. He is going to literally keep his promises. This is why I said to you at the beginning, when I watch those missiles and I looked at the arrows on the screen representing the attack against Israel, Satan is always trying to attack the promise. The promise. Israel as we know it today is not the Israel that God ultimately wants. Right? The dream assures the ultimate rule of God over the earth, not only in the millennial kingdom, but also in the continued display of God's sovereignty in the new heaven and new earth that will follow that millennial kingdom. You feel like you ate some spiritual dinner today? That's the kind of food we should be looking for. God is good and he is sovereign. And I urge you to spend time in these coming days on your knees, praying for the peoples of the world, people of the Middle East, praying for salvation, and praying for an urgency to hit your soul that you have never known before. And I ask you, not selfishly, but for the sake of the gospel, if you believe in what Hope and Passion Ministries is doing, by proclaiming these things so clearly. You have an obligation to ask the Lord, do I need to support that we can keep doing this? Right? This is a big deal, the days we're living in. I've been committed to this end time prophecy. I've been preaching 40 years. But I've been committed to end time prophecy for about 13 or 14. And now I see why God had me do that. Praise his name. Father, I thank you so much for the time we've had in your word this morning. What a fitting message. It was all because of you. You knew ahead of time. I thank you for giving me the grace that only comes from you to be able to share your word. And I thank you for every heart that has received it. My prayer now is that those who need to respond to Jesus Christ, the only bridegroom that is utterly and completely faithful, the only marriage that will last forever and never be broken in any way is the marriage of the church of Jesus Christ to Jesus himself. And if you need to be a part of the bride of Christ, call upon him today and ask him to save your soul from sin and deliver you from darkness. And dear Jesus, raise up your army, people who take you seriously, people who discern the times in which we live. Amen.